Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Ahmed. And uh, as I think that was a bit of a mouthful, mouthful for uh, my name is Farah Chowdhury. I have BT Security Services for Middle East and Africa based in Dubai. And uh, first of all, it's a, it's a great honor to be speaking at uh, this event. I've been coming to Saudi Arabia for, I think, the last 15 years. And this is a great turnout. You know, the, the room has been full. I just want to comment on one of the things um, Engineer Ahmed was saying well, about the services and the maturity um, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I was, you know, coming through Riyadh Airport, and I've been coming through Riyadh Airport, like I said, for the last 15 years, and I hadn't come in about a year. You know, other priorities took me elsewhere, but just coming through the airport was such a great, great experience. I was, you know, um, from the plane out of immigration in like 15 minutes into my hotel within 30 minutes after that. And you know, I had done my visa in Dubai where I'm based. I had done my biometrics there at Wadi Mall. And when I came here, literally it was less than 30 seconds when I gave the general the immigration officer my passport, scan, look at my picture, and away you go. So the integration of me doing my fingerprints and biometrics in Dubai was obviously captured here in immigration here. So the services are definitely, definitely improving. There's a rapid, uh, rapid improvement on that. So today what I'm gonna talk about is how, you know, protecting your most critical assets. Okay. Which, you know, today is about brand. So my thought today, you know, is really about getting a little bit of a paradigm shift when it comes to security is not just about the tin, the technology, it's all about, you know, having that mindset change, um, you know, throughout, uh, throughout the organization. Now, when we talk about cybersecurity, we also need to talk about innovation. We are at an age, or globally, where innovation is everywhere. Innovation happens in the home today. We see many, many teenagers creating apps. We are seeing individuals who are not programmers by trade creating apps that are helping productivity, entertainment when it comes to games. You know, so innovation is not only happening in these research and development labs that we see, or the MITs, the Cambridge, the Oxford. Innovation is everywhere. We're even seeing individuals in your organization doing some sort of innovation. It's not just the PhDs anymore. And what comes with innovation comes with a lot of data that is being spread around the world, starting from our homes, to our mobile phones, to you know, our work PCs, when before our work PCs were maybe just about you know, Excel spreadsheets, Outlook email, you know, Internet Explorer, innovation is happening everywhere. And never in history have we had a rapid rate of innovation as we are seeing today. We are seeing innovation labs opening all over the world. BT opened up an innovation lab in Abu Dhabi in conjunction with the local telecom provider and Khalifa University. So even we're branching outside of the UK. Innovation happening now is creating a lot of data. We used to talk about gigs of data. Then we talked about terabytes of data. I'm now speaking to customers and they're talking about petabytes of data. We're speaking to one of the media companies in Dubai who says they need to store 15 petabytes of data. So we are again at an age where we are storing so much data. Forget the Googles of the world, the Yahoo, they're probably on another level, yeah? With the amounts of data that is being stored. And this is affecting security as we see today. Innovation in our consumer technologies. We're now moving to 4K, Ultra HD TVs, smart TVs, yeah? The internet of things, and I love what Naveen said, or the insecurity of things, so I'm gonna steal that from my next conference. But the internet of things, everything, smart fridges, smart microwaves. I was in Carrefour in Dubai the other day when they had microwaves with an internet connection. Don't ask me what it is needed, maybe to update the ROM or whatever, but we are getting everything digitally connected. In the United States, they're launching now uh, internet in the car, where it can measure the speed, it measures the brakes, measures the tire pressure. Where are all this data going? So the data 
is flowing everywhere. And then collaboration. We are at a time where collaboration is massive. We are a global workforce today. Everybody is on social network has really changed the way we communicate as a human species. No longer do we just sit on the mobile phones and talk to our friends or our mothers or our fathers, relatives for hours at a time. We used to do that. Now it's we have family WhatsApp groups. We have technology WhatsApp groups. Social media has really changed the way we communicate. Yeah? They were, um, he, um, Engineer Ahmed was talking about, you know, we do our work from anywhere in the world, which is true. We are a global workforce going from the United States or Canada to here just for a few meetings happens on a very, very regular basis now. Traveling around the world is not a problem, means that we need access to that data, access to our tools from anywhere in the world. So social media has really, really played a part in what we do. And this is what's happening from a technology space. Yeah? And you know, a lot of this, these things can have an hour, hour and a half presentation behind it, but a lot of this is really changing the security landscape as we see it today. Security is touching every part of the organization and even every part of our human life, even at home. As a consumer of internet services, it is touching. And some of the things we see here, everything we think about in our organization, from security of the executives and the senior management, so when they travel around the world, the physical security of them, to our supply chain. Okay, It's not just about you know, securing against viruses. These are now you know, fundamental things that we do or the, you know, securing the internet connection that we have, but the supply chain, the development life cycle, the branch offices that are growing around the world. It touches everything, even when we're at home. We're now buying routers to connect to the internet with either VPNs built into it, yeah? So the common person at home is now talking the language of, oh, I need a VPN. And if you have security in your job title, everyone seems to come ask you, what is the best VPN to buy? What is the best virus to buy? We want, we're, we want parental control on our mobile phones, on our tablets for our children. So security is touching not only everything in the organization, but even the consumer, even us and our family members, our children, as they turn into teenagers, we're talking security. And because the, the, the landscape is changing, it is becoming very, very challenging. We have high profile loss. You cannot pick up a newspaper today and not see some sort of security incident. So the industry, the media is talking security, security, security. Look how many conferences there are now. This room is full because security, everyone is talking about it. And I'll give some examples a little later cloud and the convergence of the network, the consolidation and the convergence of 3G networks, 4G networks, MPLS, regular IP connect, our SCADA networks, yeah? There are now a whole branch of SCADA security experts and the convergence of coming onto IP, the cloud. Everyone is pushing cloud, cloud, cloud. We use cloud services as consumers I can be sure that every single person in this audience is using some sort of cloud services, be it Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, iCloud, whatever social media we use, we're using cloud services. And now enterprises, corporate, with all the IT budget cuts, yet the improvement and innovation of IT, everything is moving to the cloud. The vendors the Microsofts of this world, the Oracles, the SAPs are starting to push their services or their service offerings into the cloud. And then we heard earlier about mobility and the way we're a global workforce. These are bringing risks into our daily life. And then hacking, you can go to many conferences, Hacking is no longer a hobby. And I'm gonna give some examples a little later on, but I'm sure every single person in here 
reads about it in the news. Even the common person who's not in security or not in IT will know about all the hacking that is going around in the world. We're talking about the $100 million plus. They still don't know the value bank heist that happened two weeks ago. I'll mention that a little later on. But, you know, even my wife at home asked me about it. Was my bank account affected by it? This is my wife asking me at the dinner table. So these are the conversations now that are happening, not just in the boardroom, not just at these conferences, even at the dinner table at home. And then the rise of the collective. So I like using this phrase because I'm such a big Star Trek fan, next generation only, not the older series. But the rise of the collective is all about you know, the anonymous and all the subgroups of this world. They are a force that is causing issues and job security for guys like me. But anonymous is a force that is out there and causing a lot of havoc, causing a lot of people to change their strategy, adopt their strategy, spend money on security, yeah? Anonymous is a group that is global. And the reason why they're dangerous is because they're not really that organized, they're very loose, no hierarchy to them. There is no CEO of Anonymous, there is no CFO. They are very, very collaborative in what they do and they're very, very effective in what they do, you know? And everyone's talking about them. You know, my, uh, I was speaking at a conference a couple of months ago, and my 16, well, now 17-year-old son, he was 16 at the time, was asking me, oh, what are you talking about? And I was giving a whole hour presentation about Anonymous, where they came from, and what they're doing, and going into a lot more, a lot of detail about their structure. And I said, I'm talking about Anonymous. And he goes, oh, they do so-and-so, and they do this, and they broke into this. And I was like, wow. So even teenagers, are even talking about what Anonymous does. So, you know, like I said, everyone is talking about the security world at the moment. So we talked about, you know, some things that are happening in the media, and I'm sure every single person here today has heard about this, but the US just announced a large amount of money as a bounty to try and track down the person who was responsible for the botnet that did that largest cyber bank heist in history. Whenever we heard the term bounty, we typically only saw it on TV in the United States, to you know, a bounty hunter, go and find the person that murdered someone, so on and so forth. Now we're hearing it in the digital world. So the United States government put a bounty on that. We heard a couple of weeks ago, less than two weeks ago, about SIM cards being broken into now. And just yesterday, Jamalto was saying, well, no, actually, it's not true. Our private keys, our encryption wasn't actually broken into, and everyone's SIM card is OK. But this, again, they are the biggest SIM provider in the world. And again, we think, OK, there may be some insecurity in our, in our SIM cards. And then we have a researcher out of the US who just put millions and millions of username and passwords out there on the internet to say, look, this is what's happening. This is how easy it is. Typically, when researchers used to post things out, they would only post passwords. So there was, you know, a couple of months ago, there was an article that came out with the top 25 most used passwords out there. But the usernames and associated them were never ever released. He just released large amounts of data that he was able to capture for username and passwords. And on the 25 most used passwords, one of them was Mustang, and then the American car manufacturer actually used that as a PR initiative, uh, saying that, look, Mustang is in one of the top 25 most used passwords. So I don't know how that worked out for them. And then Superfish. Again, right after the Jamalto incident, we had Lenovo in the industry putting in some sort of malware or adware or spyware, whichever the way you want to look at it, that created man in the middle attack, was able to see or take your HTTPS, what we know, what we inherently think is secure. We had something that we bought safely from whichever manufacturer you bought it from, and mostly had, they found it on consumer Lenovo machines, that would steal your HTTPS. So we think we're buying something 
that shouldn't have a back door, shouldn't have malware, should be a plain vanilla operating system and we install whatever we want. Lenovo came out and said, yes, sorry, here's some software to uninstall it and we have a strategy in place going forward not to put spyware, malware, adware onto those PCs. So why am I here to talk to you about brand? We're not at a marketing conference. We're not at a you know, social media conference, but I'm here to talk to you about brand to change that paradigm shift. We are all security professionals in this room. We're all buying firewalls, next generation firewalls, IPSs, APT viruses. That we need to do that. But our strategy is to protect what? Our organizations, their brand is the most important thing. So if we take here, and I just looked last night before I came up this morning from my hotel room, and these are still valid, is these are the top brands that us as a consumer utilize in our daily life. Everyone in this room, I can be sure of it, has some of this brand either in our pocket, in our laptop bag, in our hotel room. We might even be consuming it right now at the moment. We all know that Apple has the largest cash storage in the world at the moment, largest brand. So these are brands that we consume. The way we go about our lives somewhat are affected. Microsoft, IBM, Google, I'm sure we're all, some people are probably checking their Gmail at the moment. So we're consuming these brands today. So they really drive our land. So what that means is that your brand, and I'm gonna talk about what your brand is, is an asset that needs protecting, okay? And you know, what we use to protect that, well, I'm sure we're gonna hear about it over the next two days. We're gonna hear a lot of, a lot of technology, a lot of processes. We heard about great training that is needed, training not only in the enterprise, but even training for consumers at home, okay? But my, fav my favorite quote is there, and this is from the chairman of Quaker, so I grew up, born and raised as a Canadian, and I grew up on Quaker. They were you know, one of the first uh, uh, consumer packaged goods companies, cereal, snack bars, drinks. And you know, he states that if this business were split up, I would give you the mortar and the brick, so I would give you the physical assets, and I would keep the IP of the brand, and I would fare better than you. This just showed in the early 1900s that the brand was more important to that chairman than the actual physical assets. Because you can buy physical assets very, very quickly, but to rebuild your brand, A, takes a long time, and sometimes it can never recover. And then us as individuals, people, because we are such in a digital age, we also have brands. Everyone who is on social media, especially if you're very, very active and use social media effectively, you start to build your brand. Saudi Arabia has one of the highest concentration of Twitter users in the world. What this slide here is just showing, these are the top 10 most followed Twitter users. So you can see most of them are entertainers, that's fine, but you have YouTube, you know, you have, a, you know, uh, Ellen DeGeneres. So you have a lot of people who build brands, but even in this part of the world, people will have Instagram pages, Facebook pages, you know, even if you're a small business, you have promotions on Facebook. But then, again, that brand of our, ourselves as an individual, me standing up here, speaking to you guys, is also about my brand as a person, my brand as an organization that I'm representing, but we all heard about the iCloud breach and how celebrities' photos were leaked. This was damaging to their brand. So even us as individuals have a brand, especially if you're on social media, and that needs to be protected. Remember, we, we put so much onto the cloud, we need to start thinking about is my data that's going into the cloud secure? My Instagram, the things I put on Gmail. Gmail, yeah, we put all that data and we allow Gmail or Google and Facebook to advertise for us. So we, we inherently trust that those cloud providers 
are securing my data. Yeah, we, 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 yes, we allow them to advertise, advertise or put the right things in front of us, but then what's happening with the pictures, with the attachments, with everything I'm sending through the cloud? Yeah, again, this affects us as individuals and our brand. And it affects companies. I'll talk about companies here in a few minutes, but we all heard about Sony years and years and years ago. It, it's really what started this whole craze about you know, what's happening to us as organizations, and it's happened to them two or three times. You know. Sometimes I feel a bit sorry for, uh, for Sony. But you know, the short story is, is that they were so damaged as an organizational brand, that picture there is the executive committee in Japan, very honorable society, bowing on national TV, apologizing for the PlayStation hack for it being down at weeks at a time. You can see they were, they were fined by the European Union for hundreds of millions of dollars, affected their share price negatively. So a cybersecurity incident affecting the organization's not only brand, but also their value in the market, their market value. eBay, one year ago today, eBay had very, very large breach affected their quarterly profits because people for a short period, we're humans, we forget, we're not as short memory as goldfish, but we do forget, we forgive, and we move on. eBay had a massive incidence, it dipped for a while their sales, but one year later, again, record profits for eBay, and then Target. Target, one of the largest retailers in the United States, had one of the largest breaches, about 70 million records were stolen, there was so much pressure, because they're a public company, by the SEC, the, the um, Security Exchange C Commission, that the CEO ended up resigning because of a cybersecurity breach. So first the CFO left, and then the CEO, CEO fell due to pressure. So it does affect even executive committee level. And in the Middle East, we are not immune. We are at a time of the world where Middle Eastern brands are, are growing globally. I'm sure many, many people in here are Premier League, British Premier League football fans. So I'm a big Manchester United fan. We won 2-0 last night, so if anybody else is a Man United fan, you know, scrappy win. However, we watch these games. We watch Arsenal, we watch Man City, Manchester United, who have global viewership, and what do we see? Global brand, uh, Middle Eastern brands. We watch the World Cup, if it's rugby or if it's football, we see Middle Eastern brands, the Olympics, a lot of Middle Eastern brands. So we're getting global exposure of those brands. We're seeing these organizations now, how do I protect myself from a cyber perspective? Because everything is connected there. I'm getting a one minute message. Two slides left, one slide really. So security is not just an IT discussion anymore. It is, security has gone from the geeky, nerdy data center discussion had to the boardroom. More and more times where I'm going to organizations or to going to governments to speak about cybersecurity initiatives, we're getting the CFO involved, the COO. The COO is telling their CISOs what, what are we doing about cybersecurity? So it's no longer just about you know, technology. It is a business level issue today. And I leave you with this last slide. It, it's very simplistic. It is not rocket science when we talk about cybersecurity. It's all about risk management. And when we understand what our risks are and one of those risks should be about our brand. So when we're doing our risk management program is how will a cybersecurity incident affect the brand of me as an individual, me as an organization, and me as a country? Even on a country level now, we have certain brands. Why do you think the British government has the UK trade and investment all around the world? They're selling British brands around the world. So once we understand our risks, we put some mitigation around it, and then we just make sure we manage it very, very diligently, and then we have a global, uh, good, mature 
cybersecurity program. So I leave you with that. I am here for the next two days. Um, obviously, I understand and walking around. I don't know if we have time for questions. We don't have time for questions, I'm being told. So if anybody has any questions for me, I'll be uh, around for the next two days. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tariq.